Okay, just a lot to say about Laodicea. So here is part three and really our appendix, our addendum, um, the does it fit section. So we'll look at the church age theory, the Matthew 13 parable, and the letter to Colossians. So according to the church age theory, Laodicea would be a model of really our modern church or what's called the apostate church. Now apostate is, is kind of a $10 word that really just means fallen away, um, specifically renouncing a previous belief that one professed. So we've talked about Jews in name only through some of these letters. The apostate church would contain Christians in name only. In Matthew 15, 18, um, Jesus quotes Isaiah 29 by saying, Isaiah 29, 13, um, the people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So an apostate is not merely an unbeliever, but one who uh, has fallen away and is now actively proclaiming a destructive theology and perhaps uh, doing so even unwittingly. So the apostate church would be a church that is conforming to the world's image and pushing out God so that he is outside the door knocking to get in, just like at Laodicea. So this behavior was prophesied by Paul uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. So the word for rebellion that this is the ESV uses is actually apostasia. And that's the word for apostate. So we tend to think of rebellion as the sense of unbelievers rebelling against God, but this is actually talking about a falling away with, from within the apostate church. Second Corinthians six discusses that we are to have no portion with an unbeliever, no mixture with idols. Uh, we are to keep ourselves separate. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial or the devil? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? So the church of Laodicea was undoubtedly mixed up with idol worship. For we are the temple of the living God. And as God said, I make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So what the Laodicean church was not doing was keeping themselves separate and keeping themselves pure. And uh, on the website, I've got a list of uh, several additional verses that speak of apostasy in the last days. And maybe we'll hit some of those as we head into the, uh, the middle part of Revelation. So why do scholars equate Laodicea with this apostasy, the uh, apostate church? This can really be traced to the turn of the 20th century. And uh, really in the late 1800s, there was what's called German higher criticism. Uh, and, and out of this came the documentary hypothesis. So it was a form of modernism and rationalism that you, you kind of denied uh, and, and questioned everything. So these philosophies denied the inerrancy of the Bible and they did so using these German rationalist methods. And sort of the pioneer of this, if I could call him that, was a guy by the name of Julius Wellhausen. And so he came up with what's called the doctor documentary hypothesis that said, uh, you know, among other the themes, uh, things, Rose, Moses didn't write the books of Moses. You had all these different authors. Some of them were even written after the, uh, the return from Babylon. Um, you have this Deutero Isaiah theory, um, which says that there's actually one or maybe two, not just one, but two or three different writers of the book of Isaiah. So just casting doubt on everything and, and you know claiming to, to, to follow the Bible, but you're denying everything about it. Uh, any prophecies uh, that we see in the Bible because they're, they're not really prophecies because they're written after the fact and only made to look like prophecies. So um, a, an example of this would be uh, Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple, but because that book was written after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, you know, some other person just wrote that in as if Jesus said that, 
um, to make it look like it was fulfilled prophecy. So not really true. Casting, really casting doubt on everything. Uh, recently, um, uh, there was what's called the Jesus Seminar, and they actually, you know, this, these so-called scholars cast votes on what Jesus said and didn't said, and they concluded that Jesus only said about 20% of the things he's quoted as saying. And so this led to big divisions between uh, what are called, you know, fundamentalists and you use that people use that term pejoratively uh as a put down and then modernists who are the rational thinkers um and you know the the church trying to walk between these lines uh was stressed unity and and tolerant through all this and so um really around the the 1900s uh, this began to infiltrate the the mainline denominations and particularly the presbyterian church by a guy by the name of Charles Briggs, and he was a seminary professor at the Union Theological Seminary. So you have this modernist, you know, liberal, and we use that in, a, in the Christian sense, not necessarily a political sense. He's now in a prominent position uh, to teach future ministers who then go out and, you know, pastor churches, and they're spreading this doctrine throughout their churches. And you can only imagine that a, a generation or two later, you know, we were <laughs> we were, you know, off and running with with this uh, bad doctrine. Um, so this caused a great divide between modernists and fundamentalists. And in a sense, if, if we're Southern Baptists, uh, Southern Baptists actually rejected modernist thought throughout um, throughout the years, only not without a struggle, but the, but they tried to remain pure. Uh, but really, just about every other major denomination had these splits. So an example would be the uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church versus the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Um, you know, the ELCA would be quite liberal. Um, you know, gays would be ordained and, you know, all, you know, kind of everything that goes along with that. Whereas the um, LCMS, Missouri Synod, would say, no, we're, we're keeping, keeping literal to the Bible. And so really, rather than fight the apostasy, many of these modern liberal churches, they stressed unity. But it's, it's unity with the liberal tenets, right? So again, it's the very folks who preach unity and tolerance are the most intolerant of you if you disagree with them. And so we started seeing this in the church and just major church splits along um, doctrinal lines. The other thing about Laodicea that was very, that is very comparable to our age is that uh, we, we talk about their wealth. They were extremely wealthy and comfortable. Um, Todd Boland writes in the caption to this picture here, as the city grew, so did the theater hungry crowds. To supplement the outgrown Western theater, the bigger and more expensive Northern theater was built. And you can see that's the picture of the Northern theater on your screen. So, uh, it, you know, going to many churches today is not that much different than going to a rock concert. Uh, there's there's comfy chairs. There's sometimes they have cup holders. The theater is completely dark. You have this elaborate light show on the stage. Uh, the music is loud. You've got smoke machines sometimes. There's even a merch table in the lobby that's next to the coffee stand. You know, so all, all of this is just meant to entertain the masses and not necessarily to teach the masses. And so people walk out of a service like that. You know, a good service would be one that is emotionally stirring. And a bad service would be when the pastor preaches a sermon from the word that you know makes me uncomfortable and challenges me. So we've got um, basically, um, Fruchtenbaum said, churches, church programs are based on giving people what they want, not giving people what they need. And he quips, Satan would not be a very good deceiver if he made one feel bad. Satan can give people joyful and happy experiences rather than the word of God. And then those experiences then become the final authority for determining spiritual truth. So again, they're not to say that the word of God isn't taught at, at these churches, but um, certainly it's, it's it's a comfort and you know getting people in, seeker friendly, all of that plays into um, you know some form of the apostate church, and then people are you know being deceived. And so would Jesus be knocking at the door of one of these churches trying to trying to get in? Now my friend uh, and pastor Dan Stolbarger. Um, he he told us that he had a dream one time where uh, they were going to church and Jesus was in you know appeared in the back seat of his car and uh, Jesus asked you know where are we going and you know they said well we're going to church and uh, he, ah I see said Jesus so they you know all parked and went inside to the, one of these modern churches and came out about an hour later and Jesus asked now what was that again and you know they said well that was church. Jesus says, 
not what I had in mind. And so, of course, our goal is not to be critical of, of others' practices, but we really want to look more at areas of our life uh, where we are compromising. But part of that, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, is we need to be aware of false teaching, and, and so we stay far from it. And the last of the Matthew 13 parables would be the parable of the dragnet. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into their fiery, fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we have the separation of the good from the bad. Uh, Jesus uh, approaches a, you know, what is essentially a dead apostate church. He's calling some to repent. And, you know, given what we know about human nature, probably a very small remnant repented while the vast majority went on their way and, and perished. And so we, had, we see the separation of good and bad. And, and note, um, if you are skeptical of the rapture theory, um, this is one of those examples where we have the bad being removed and the good remaining. So uh, food for thought there. Um, Jesus explains this parable in, in 49 and 50, so we don't really need to go into it much more than that. But um, we, we see this uh, possible connection between the parable of the dragnet and the church of Laodicea. And then lastly, uh, our, our Paul letter tie-in. So Paul wrote to seven cities, just like uh, John authored seven cities of Turkey. And the last one that Paul wrote to that we haven't talked about yet is Colossians. And of course, Colossians is just a natural fit for Laodicea. And as we talked about in part one, um, the two were essentially sister cities um, along with Hierapolis. In Colossians 4, 16 and 17, the two cities were instructed to exchange letters. Uh, Paul even referenced a letter that he wrote to the Laodiceans that has since been lost. And again, we, we wonder what that would have said and, and maybe did it did it have some uh, um, uh, you know, possible preludes of, of what was about to happen at the Church of Laodicea. So as we read through Colossians, um, having studied the context of Laodicea, there do definitely appear to be some um, ominous warnings. Um, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So Colossians 1.13, you know, telling them you've got to be on the lookout for darkness. Paul said to the Corinthians, darkness has no fellowship with light. Uh, and so they, they didn't keep that in mind, you know, <laughs> a, a couple of decades later. Um, Colossians 1 um, talks about, 115 talks about Jesus being the firstborn of all creation. And that was a direct reference in the letter to Laodicea. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him uh, and for him. Again, another potential warning, Colossians 2, 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Uh, Colossians 2, 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So Laodicea was following the spirits of the world and, and not, not Jesus our Messiah. So it's interesting to read Colossians in after and really all of Paul's letters after studying the struggles that the early church in Turkey had. Colossians 2.16, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Now, it's usually taught in, in Protestant circles that this verse is one that allows Gentiles to eat anything and it's Judaizers who are telling believers that they must go back and follow the Jewish law. However, if you go back and look at the struggle that some of these churches had and the warning that Jesus gave, um, in keeping with Acts 15.29 was the call to call, be called out of pagan society. And so the, the assembly at Colossae were totally immersed in that pagan society. Um, they were wealthy and they had to be, uh, you know, the believers there had to be separate and called apart from that. So in thinking of, of from that perspective, wouldn't it be more likely that this mostly Jewish assembly, especially at the time Paul was writing, um, they, were, they were probably trying to follow the Jewish dietary laws uh, Rosh Kodesh is a, a minor holiday that celebrates the first day of the of month on the Jewish calendar, which cor correlates with the new moon. And then keeping Shabbat in the face of pagan opposition when they were being ostracized if they had done that. So to me, it, it seems uh, you know equally as plausible 
uh, if not even more likely, that this isn't saying that uh, Gentiles can eat anything, but it's it's saying, no, keep holding to the higher standard that God would have for you and do not conform, do not do not cave in to pagan society. So again, something to think about. So reread Colossians 2, especially in light of what we know about the seven churches and Laodicea, and um, you know, do Acts 17.11. Don't take my word for it, but do your own homework. A couple more verses uh, from chapter 3. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are this earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So again, separate, be separate from the world. Put to death, uh, verse 5, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And we certainly felt that wrath in the letter to the, Laodice the church of Laodicea, the, the warning um, to repent and uh, become clean. So not directly tied into uh, the letter to Laodiceans, but a, a interesting note here on two people that had two different outcomes. And we see this in the book of Colossians. So 4 verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, the, the one we believe wrote the Gospel of Mark, con concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So if we look at Acts 15, 39, there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other, meaning they Mark basically was a little flaky and Paul and Barnabas uh, came to blows nearly. Um, so they split ways, Paul went one way and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. So note that Colossians would have been written after this episode in Acts 15. So they had that split, Paul was very unhappy with Mark, um, but then by the time Colossians was written, you know, Mark is back in the fold with Barnabas and you know, welcome him. So in a sense, we say that Mark had you know, answered the call to repent and he repented and he was, in quotes, I'll say redeemed. Now, very different story with this guy named Demas. Luke, uh, in 4.14, uh, this is guy is in the fold also at this time. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, one who wrote Luke, as does Demas. And then in 2 Timothy, so this is at the very end of Paul's life, um, he doesn't have such kind words to say about Demas. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica, uh, and so on and so forth. So note that Colossians would have been written before 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy was written uh, just before Paul was about to be uh, beheaded in Rome. So the opposite of Mark, Demas was once a fellow worker in uh, Philemon verse 24, uh, but Demas fell away. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not on how you start, it's how you finish. And so our, our reminder in that all of these seven churches contain a promise to the overcomer and that the overcomer is the one who finishes well. So that wraps it up for our study of the seven letters to seven churches. We'll be in chapter four next time and we will see you then.